All right, I'm Nick Doran. Uh, I am a web developer. I'm not a physicist or a computer scientist by training. But we're going to talk about post-quantum DevOps. What? What is that? So, uh, going back to the beginning of computing, you had the vacuum tube. And then those weren't really useful. There were things we couldn't do with them. So we switched over to the transistor. And then they're putting more transistors on bigger and smaller chips. And they're getting cheaper. And transistors are taking over. But we're about to reach this end point of Moore's Law. Like it's been accelerating, it's been going very well, but it doesn't go on forever because we're making the transistors so small now that transistors can be a single atom or single molecule or single crystal. And you can't get much smaller than that. Like there's nothing smaller than that in the universe, like in our physical understanding. It's not physically possible. So people have been talking about what happens at Moore's Law. Does computer progress stop? Or do we switch over beyond transistors? And there are lots of different ideas about this, you know, like optical computing or carbon nanotubes. But this talk is about quantum computing, so forget about all those other things. Uh, so quantum computers have this idea that there's a quantum state where you're not zero or one, but both at the same time. And that's a qubit. And if you get multiple qubits together, let's say n qubits, they're simultaneously at two to the n states. So that means a lot of things. I don't fully understand this, but there's certain different algorithms that you can run on qubits that you haven't been able to do before. And a lot of them have to do with uh, factoring prime numbers. They don't solve NPR problems, but they do break a lot of existing encryption today. So people are freaking out for like about 20 years, theoretically, this is going to break stuff. Do quantum computers even exist? Uh, ironically, they both exist and don't exist today. Uh, Deep Wave makes this thing, which they say is a quantum computer, and then more advanced science people have said it's not really one, or it's the wrong kind of quantum computer, or something like that. I don't fully understand. And then there are other people who say, like, you know, a quantum computer has to be at absolute zero. It kind of will become incoherent. It doesn't really exist the way we want it to. So maybe a quantum computer will never exist. It's hard to really say. But what if it did, okay? This could be a big problem for us. Uh, and the NSA has been working on this for a few years. They have like an underground Faraday cage lab that they've been working on it. And then this year they started saying, if one did exist, how would we prepare for it? Just like imagine if one did. Like let's start worrying about that. So maybe they know something that we don't, okay? <laughs> like I don't know the truth of this, but someone's gonna be trying to do it and working really hard at it. So how does that affect us? How can we prepare for that? Uh, so it breaks a lot of existing encryption, causes a lot of problems for people in that regard. Uh, and some people think, oh, let's use quantum computers to encrypt stuff to each other. Uh, but that takes really advanced computers. In this diagram, they're all using laptops. But you need a really giant computer cooling stuff to absolute zero to do quantum to quantum computers. So there's all these different algorithms people have been talking about testing out. Uh, I'm not going to read them out now because I don't know how to say them exactly. But they're testing these out, putting them through the paces. Uh, different ideas that people have for things regular computers can run that quantum computers can't break. And actually, the winning one is going to be lattice-based encryption. I'm not sure why, but everyone's like piling on this one bandwagon of lattice-based encryption. So you have vector fields and different geometry going on there, and you're able to encrypt things using this. I don't really know how this works, but there's different libraries out there. And one benefit of this is something called homomorphic encryption, where you can encrypt your data, send it to somewhere for processing, and they send it back to you and decrypt it. And they never see your actual data, but they're able to run operations on it anyway. So this would be a new kind of software as a service. Uh, let's talk about uh, HTTPS, TLS kind of stuff. Uh, everything that's out there right now uses prime number factors. And so your strength of your key is about half, as if the key is half as long. Uh, so ironically, AES-256 is the best thing to be using right now because it brings it down to the strength of AES-128 today in its classical computers. And people are using that all the time on Chrome. You can actually go into Firefox and disable a lot of ciphers, so you're just using this. Uh, and then Google started working on something called Boring SSL, which actually is really interesting, ironically. And uh, they use something called Ring Learning with Errors, which is based on lattice encryption, to do some interesting uh, experiments in doing HTTPS with post-quantum encryption. On answer questions, do quantum computers even exist? Uh, will they ever exist? Uh, Will these existing codes last against rigorous testing, both quantum and classical computers? No one really knows, uh, but I'm interested in it. I'm reading a lot about it. I'm Nick Doran. These are some different sources. You can read more about it. And also, I'm like looking for a job. So if you want me to talk to you about quantum computers, I'll talk to you about that. All right, thanks.